uh, uh, this Quantum Interaction 2018. It is the 11th edition of this conference. And uh, we shall start with, uh, we have very distinguished guests who will hold uh, uh, keynote lectures. And we shall start with Michel Bitbol. And this afternoon, which is quite a new thing, we'll have a joint session with the CPCABM, I've never known what that stands for, which is a linguistic uh, 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 conference uh, or workshop in linguistic, and we'll have the chance to hear the keynote speaker and uh, their work connected with uh, our quantum approach. So please let me introduce uh, Michel Bitbol, who is one of the founder and one of the really, um, I would say, uh, the great inspire of this whole field and uh, so please go ahead and you'll understand why. So he's, uh, he has very well-known uh, books uh, and a huge, I don't know how to present yourself, you're a, a theoretical physicist and then you went into uh, philosophy, epistemology and uh, so Please, uh, Thank you very much. So, uh, my purpose here is to understand why quantum theory is so universally efficient. We, we would, we would uh, call that, maybe uh, to use the terms of Jürgen Wigner, the unreasonable effectiveness of quantum theory. So, why is it so efficient in so many areas? especially in the case of the human sciences, which is the topic of this conference. Why quantum theory? It's clear that quantum theory is now applied to so many non-physical areas that trigger at the same time a general and a more and more um, important acceptance in the field of uh, scientists and um, at the same time, people wonder why it works so well, and some of them are still, still skeptical. They say, oh, maybe it's just an analogy, maybe it's just, uh, you know, chance that it works. So, it's important to understand, in, in, at the beginning of this conference, whether the, there can be a fundamental reason why quantum physics works so well in so many areas, including the human sciences. Um, for instance, we, I remember we had a conversation with Ariane at the French uh, France Culture, the radio, the cultural radio, and uh, we were confronted with a neurobiologist who was extremely skeptical. He said, it's impossible, it cannot work. Human beings are not electrons, they are not photons, they are not quarks. Why does it work? It's impossible. Well, maybe it's a vague model, it's an analogical transposition. Well, if it works, that's okay, but we don't really understand why. So that's my, my purpose here, to try to go a little bit further into this um, explanation of the reason of the effectiveness. So the acceptance of uh, the application of quantum theory in the human sciences is growing, but it's still, uh, it has a, a flavor of pure pragmatism. We use it because it works. But what about the foundation of this, uh, of this uh, good applicability? Uh, for instance, I can give you a sentence that is quoted from a recent paper about the application of quantum theory to human sciences the idea of quantum modeling. And Hong Bin Wang says that the reason why quantum theory is efficient and useful in the human sciences is that it's a richer expression scheme, richer than classical models of human decisions, of um, categorization, of behavior in situations of uncertainty. And just because quantum theory is a richer expression scheme, then it has, as he said, um, a greater modeling power. So it's just a matter of richness. 
since it's rich, it can model virtually anything. So here again, it's a poor explanation, just because maybe it's, uh, you know, there is some abilities that quantum theory has that are in excess with respect to its primary purpose, that is to represent the micro world. So, uh, I think this is really not enough. Especially when you think about the, the concept of model. What is a model? A model, from the etymology of the, the Latin language, comes from the word modulus. Modulus is a small measure. Namely, it's a likeness made to scale, like, you know, these little cars. There is a small car, there's a bigger car, and so on. And all these little cars are models, in this original sense, of the bigger car. So here, you would have the idea that quantum theory is a reduced, elementary, insufficient representation of a world out there that is much richer. But since it's a little bit richer than the classical models, then it works better than that. This is the idea. Here again, I think this is a very, very low level type of explanation. I think we can get much better explanation. Especially because quantum theory is not necessarily an image, a representation of any reality out there. The fact, you know, for instance, you can think of Bohr, he never said that the quantum theory was a model of a reality out there. He said that quantum theory is a symbolism that is used in order to predict probabilistically the outcomes of experiments made with large-scale apparatuses. So here, the concept of model was completely foreign to Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics. Bohr's interpretation of quantum mechanics is, can be called uh, an operationalistic or instrumentalistic uh, view of quantum theory, namely as a symbolic instrument to predict full stop. So it might be this, okay? Of course, both interpretations have been challenged. Now, the, the, you know, the, this interpretation is witnessing a renewal. But at any rate, it's important to know that there are interpretations of quantum mechanics in which the very concept that quantum physics can represent something is challenged. And therefore, the concept of model, which is a, a small, small level or uh, a, a likeness made to scale, a small representation of the world out there, is debatable, to say the least. Now, <coughs> I've defended for many years the idea precisely that quantum physics is not a representation of the world out there, but a generalized uh, theory of probability uh, that is supplemented with elements from classical physics, you know, the very famous correspondence principle, in order to get good predictions for uh, experiments that are made on micro entities. This interpretation was ob obviously also debatable. But the day I saw that quantum theory can be applied to so many other areas than uh, the behavior of micro-entities, for example, the behavior of human beings in situations of choice, then I thought this is a very powerful argument in favor of the idea that quantum physics is decidedly not a representation of micro world, but something else, a generalized theory of probabilities that can be applied to contextual phenomena that are mutually 
excuse it according to context. This is very simple. So, to me, the, the applicability of quantum theory to human sciences is a very good argument in favor of a non-representationalist and non-realist interpretation of quantum physics. Well, when, when just a little uh, except here. Um, when one says non-realist interpretation, that looks like someone who is far from reality. But it's not the case. A non-realist interpretation of quantum physics is also an empiricist interpretation of uh, quantum physics, and maybe even little more than that. That means an interpretation that sticks to the obvious reality that we have in the laboratories in our operations, in our actions. This is, in fact, to me, a much more realistic interpretation of quantum physics because it sticks to the most uh, immediate, tangible, visible realities that we have in everyday life. Rather than to the representations, the images that we elaborate about a putative uh, world uh, of micro-entities. Let's give, let me give a summary of the standard debate about the interpretation of quantum mechanics. Okay, first of all there is the realist interpretation, or rather the realist interpretations, because there are so many. There are, for instance, the Bohm's um, you know, hidden variable theory, there is uh, the the many worlds interpretations and, and, and so on and so on. So many, there are many um, realist interpretations of quantum theory and this might well be a sign that there is a problem when one finds or tries to find a representation of the world that fits with the formalism of quantum theory. If there, is, if there were only one acceptable realist interpretation of quantum theory that fits every that it fits all the bill and that is never contradictory in any situation then maybe one could accept this uh, interpretation but since there are so many interpretations and none of them is devoid of paradoxes then this is a sign that there might be a problem the other kind of interpretation is empiricism. Okay, so this is very clear, very simple. Um, I think probably uh, at the beginning of the elaboration of quantum uh, theory, this was a very uh, tempting way to understand quantum theory. For instance, you can think of the positivism of uh, Wolfgang Pauli or the reduction to observables of uh, Werner Heisenberg. So it's it has uh, also some credence. According to the empiricist uh, interpretations of quantum theory, quantum theory is a formal device to describe economically the statistical order of phenomena. So just that. You see phenomena in the lab, you collect many of them, and you connect each of them. You connect one to another. And that's it. You connect by symbols. No, and these symbols have no um, uh, you know, power of representation, only a power of uh, economically accepting all the data. It's called, you know, this, uh, this procedure that has been well described by Ernst Mach, the famous uh, physicist and positivist thinker of the 19th century was used many, also many centuries, even many millennia ago. Uh, there was, um, you know, a victim in astronomy and cosmology in the, the Greek and Roman times that was that um, models such as Ptolemies, Ptolemies or and uh, the models of uh, all the astronomers of antiquity were just meant to save the phenomena, just capture the phenomena 
into a mathematical scheme that connect them to one another. Okay, so it was really a minimalist conception of the theories, one that is, was even advised to Copernicus and to Galileo to adopt, because at least it would not contradict the faith of the church. And uh, for instance, Copernicus was asked to accept that his mathematical scheme was just a model to calculate easily the position of the stars and the position of the planets, not, nothing more. So these are the two extreme types of interpretation. Realist, namely quantum theory, represents something of the world out there, or empiricist, namely quantum theory is just an economical scheme to connect with the connect the phenomena to one another. But I like very much also another type of an interpretation that I consider a middle way between realism and empiricism, namely the philosophy of Immanuel Kant, which was called transcendentalism or transcendental philosophy, which, you know, transcendentalism is a catchy word. Uh, in French, usually people understand what, what it is meant because they have studied uh, Kant's philosophy even at the secondary school. But when I speak of transcendental philosophy in uh, the English-speaking world, people usually are a little bit uh, disturbed. They say, what, what, transcendental? That means something far beyond, like transcendent. Uh, something, maybe you mean like something like transcendental meditation and so on? Say, no, nothing. That this has nothing to do with uh, something far away, something that is beyond appearances. It's rather the contrary. Transcendental philosophy means that you are interested in the conditions of possibility of your ordering a set of phenomena. So it's something that is beyond the level of phenomena. The set of concepts that enable you to order these phenomena. So it's really, here again, very down to earth. It has nothing to do with something eerie. You know. Okay, so um, according to this kind of philosophy, quantum theory, and by the way also classical physics, is less than a representation of some independent reality, but more than a descriptive recipe. Why, what, is it, what is it if it's neither of the two? Or it's a little bit of both, actually. The idea is that a, a, a theory, a physical theory, and especially Newton's theory according to Kant, and quantum theory, according to more modern thinkers, such as Ernst Cassirer or uh, uh, Hans Reichenbach and so on, um, quantum theory is a formal precondition of a coherent system of predictions of contextual phenomena. That's it. So, it's very important to understand that, because if the formalism of quantum theory is a precondition of the coherent system of predictions, then the formalism of quantum mechanics has a form of necessity. It could not have been otherwise. In order not to represent the world, but just to predict a certain set of non or incompatible phenomena. Okay? This has been demonstrated uh, already by many um, people who studied quantum physics. The first, of, the first of them was a French philosopher of uh, physics called Jean-Louis Destouches. And there are many other um, redemonstrations of that in the very modern era, especially information theoretic redemonstrations of the principles of quantum physics out of very elementary postulates about the incompatibility of certain sets of phenomena. So, 
here, the, the basic philosophical attitude you see in uh, Kant's or Kant-like interpretations of quantum physics is that one has complete ontological agnosticism because one doesn't postulate anything about the world and quantum physics is not supposed to say something about the world but yet there is an explanation an epistemological explanation of the structure of quantum theory. One can tell an unequivocally why quantum mechanics has this form rather than any other form. Why is it it is uh, written in terms of state uh, vectors of a Hilbert space rather than any other kind of space. So I think this is very compelling. Now let's come to the human sciences and then we'll come back again to quantum mechanics. Um, there is a distinction between the sciences of nature and human sciences according to Obermas and according to many uh, philosophers before. Um, you know, there was a famous difference made by Wilhelm Dilthey between human sciences and, uh, and natural sciences, between Geistwissenschaften and Naturwissenschaften. And according to Dilthey, the difference was that the human sciences deal with the understanding of the actions of the others, namely the possibility for each one of us to put oneself in the skin of the other and try to understand his motivations, his uh, purposes. Whereas the natural sciences has nothing to do with motivations and purposes, nothing to do with good reasons to act, but it has uh, something to do with causes and explanations of these causes. Okay. So there is a, a basic difference that is well known since the end of the 19th century between the natural sciences and the human sciences. According to Habermas, who is a contemporary thinker, things are not very different. According to Jürgen and Habermas, there is also a very deep difference between, a very fundamental difference between uh, natural sciences and human sciences. According to him, the theories of the sciences of nature are systems of propositions about states of affairs. So namely, the idea is that natural sciences distanciate somehow from the object of their description and they formulate propositions that describe a state of affairs that is not present to us, that, that is observed by us after, at the distance, as if we were disengaged observers. Instead, in the human sciences, the complex relation between propositions and states of affairs is already present in the states of affairs that one analyzes. Namely, when you see a proposition of the human sciences, the proposition itself is part of the state of affairs that is analyzed. It cannot be detached from the process that is studied. The proposition and the state of affairs are narrowly connected. Another difference that is pointed out by uh, Abermas is uh, quoted for, from another author. The difference is that the studies of social science, and more generally human sciences, are fundamentally related to possible actions, whereas theoretical physics always refers to actual situations, according to this uh, sentence, isn't it? But presumably this sentence by uh, von Kempsky refers to classical physics, because obviously you all know that uh, when you write a state vector, it refers to possible situations. Or when you write, say, a, a path integral, Feynman path integral, this is the fundamental feature of path integral, 
it refers to all the possible paths that a particle can, can, uh, can go through. So clearly, there is a problem. Why? So, the first problem is that quantum physics always speak of possible uh, elements, possibilities and not only actualities. And second point is that a quantum phenomenon cannot be said to be detached from the conditions of its uh, appearance. It cannot be detached from the apparatus that has been used in order to uh, trigger it, and it cannot be even detached from the particular occurrence of the functioning of this apparatus at a certain moment. So, clearly the two differences that are made by Habermas to distinguish the natural sciences and the human sciences can be challenged in quantum physics. So that's the reason why other authors, uh, other philosophers of the human sciences, such as Karl Otto Appel, has, uh, under, have, have pinpointed a very deep correspondence, a very deep similarity, maybe a, a, just an analogy, but that it means something very similar between uh, quantum physics and the human sciences. So let me quote Carlo Torre. In both cases, namely in quantum physics and in the human sciences, one must renounce the representation of an objective continuum of the external world whose many perspectives are in principle under theoretical control. So the idea is that usually, especially in classical uh, science, in classical physics, one could have a representation, a unified representation of a certain type of objects and that phenomena were just seen as perspectives over these uh, unified objects. Just views on uh, uh, certain objects that can be detached from the apparatus that is used in order to get the views. But instead, one observes here, namely in, in both quantum theory and the human sciences, one observes incompatible complementary aspects of the world. Complementary means mutually exclusive and not only uh, jointly indispensable, okay, according <coughs> to, the, to the definition of four. Why is it so? Why why is it impossible to use the metaphor of perspective in the case of quantum physics? Why is it that one has incompatible uh, phenomena? It's because each phenomenon, each aspect of the world, is inextricably linked to a certain modality of intervention. And one cannot disentangle this aspect of the world or this phenomenon with a certain modality of intervention. So this is, this according to Apple, is a common feature to quantum theory and the human science. Then he adds that the aspects of nature constituted by microphysical experiments are objectively incompatible and therefore comparable to the mutually exclusive conceptions of all the world in the human sciences, in the Gaia's so, clearly there is an analogy, and this analogy is, um, is formulated in terms of both complementarism. But, even, even so, uh, Carlo Toapel recognized that there is still a difference between quantum theory and, uh, and, uh, and human science. According to him, quantum mechanics brings out the distinction between subject and object only at the level of the statistical explanation of the be behavior of sets of particles. Why? Because there is no incompatibility, for instance, to, to get the statistics of the position and the momentum of a certain particle. They are not incompatible. You can, you can describe them uh, completely and uh, and uh, they will not change according to the set, to the apparatus you use. 
Instead, when you try to uh, predict with exactness, sharpness, the value of a position of a particle and the value of the momentum of the same particle, then you get into trouble and you, have, you are submitted to the well-known uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relations. But for statistics, there is no problem. Or for unsharp measurements, by the way, you know, certainly the case of the unsharp measurement, there is absolutely no problem, there is no incompatibility. So, another difference, according to Apple, is that the interventionist conception of knowledge is even more important in human sciences than in microphysics, according to him. The latter, namely in microphysics, is still, still able to submit the in-principle impredictability of observation outcomes to laws, namely the laws of quantum mechanics, the, for instance the Schrodinger equation, and so on and so on. Instead, Apple says that this is a problem. The human sciences deal with unique and irreversible states of affairs. Now we know thanks to you, thanks to your work, that maybe, in certain situations, the human sciences are liable to a low-like behavior. And this low-like behavior is precisely similar to the one of quantum physics. So, here, maybe, Apple was a little bit too pessimistic. Uh, Jean Piaget also has challenged the traditional difference between natural perception and gas perception. He challenged by, by mentioning the obvious fact that scientists, including physicists, are human beings. And you cannot completely skip their role in the construction of physical theory. Uh, so, according to him, the difference, the well known difference between explanation and understanding, which is the mark of the difference between the human sciences and the natural sciences since this died in the 19th century might be excessive because you may uh, try to understand the motivation of the scientists and especially the physicists who built the quantum uh, theory. And when you try to understand the motivation of the physicists who built the quantum theory, then you have an amazing insight into the true nature of quantum theory. <coughs> and therefore, we can try to inquire into quantum theory, not as a theory of the world, but as a theory of a certain position of human beings in the world. It, this is what I call the relation of, between us and nature from our human first-person standpoint to deal with the world. What should we do to deal with the world? What, what kind of instrument do we have to use in order to be at home in the world? So these are completely different questions with respect to the traditional realist questions about what must be the world in order to fit with the formalism of quantum theory. You, you see the difference. The first, probably the first, one of the first philosophers at least, who tried to understand the physical theories and in general human knowledge from the standpoint of human beings rather than from the God's eye standpoint, was David Hume. For instance, one could say, okay, causes and effects are realized in the world. One object pushes another, and this is why we try to gather all these behaviors by way of the laws of causes and effects. But Hume said something completely different. He said, no, causes and, and effects are not in the world. They are something that we use in order to 
capture the regularities, the habits we have to see regularities in the phenomena. For, uh, Jung said this, the mind is determined by custom, custom, habit, to pass from any cause to its effects. It, it's because we have the habit of seeing certain regularities that we imagine that there are causes in the world. In the same way, why do we believe that there are objects out there? Tables, chairs, and so on. Just the same. It's because, in fact, you know, when we go out this room and come back, we see something similar. And we say, this is the same object. But in fact, the object has slightly changed. The light may have changed, or some, maybe some dust may have been uh, deposited on it and so on. So the object is slightly different. And yet, we don't care. We say it's exactly the same object. And you say, carelessness and inattention are necessary for us to believe that the object has not changed. Because we don't care about the little differences. We are inattentive to little differences. So you see, Hume was one of the first uh, philosophers who tried to understand the world not in terms of what it is out there independently of us, but in terms of what we have to do to believe in it. Completely different standpoint, first person standpoint. Two other standpoints that are similar because they are also first person. First, of, first standpoint the, the set of transcendental philosophies, namely not only the philosophy of Kant, but also the philosophy of Husserl. According to both authors, to both philosophers, objective knowledge is not something to be, to be captured for, 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 you, you know, from, from outside. It's not something that is to be taken for granted. But it, has something, it is something that has to be const constituted by us. Why and how? How? It's very simple. Because we just try to anticipate what will appear be be beyond the present phenomena. For instance, I see here a certain shape. And I think this is a table, because it has been put by someone for a certain purpose. So, I anticipate that when I go behind the table, I will see another surface that is similar to this one. I will see also, you know, the support of the table, and so on and so on. So, I anticipate something, and the set of my perception and my anticipation is what I call an object, from the first person standpoint. I also anticipate that you know, when I touch it, it will be hard and will afford support for something that I can put on it, and so on and so on. Th this set of perceptions and anticipation is what makes my concept of objects. Francisco Varela elaborated a more naturalized version of this theory that he called inaction. According to Francisco Varela, a living being, any living being, enacts its own world, not the world in general, not the world in abstraction of any being who lives in it, but the, the world that is being meaningful for the needs of a living being, the world that affords certain properties that enable a living being to live in it. Okay? So, a living being proposes schemes of action. Okay? We act in the world in a certain way. We act in the world in a way to, to catch things, or to touch things, or to modify things. And we propose schemes of action that are implicit anticipations of what will come. I when I do this gesture, I anticipate that when I will grasp it, it will be solid and be usable and so on and so on. 
So each action in the world is a way to anticipate the pro properties of the things that I find uh, in my environment. And when I follow stable lines of least resistance, all these uh, lines of uh, least resistance or maximum resistance, let's say optimum resistance, is precisely what I call the meaningful objects of my environment. So objects are not just to be taken to be out there, they are meaningful sets of properties and anticipated, especially anticipated properties. One interpretation of quantum physics that has been elaborated in this spirit, namely in the spirit of first person understanding of quantum theory, is the uh, so called quantum biases or cubism with it for it. It's acronym. So Chris Hooks precisely wrote this. According to him, Wittgenstein said that I is not the name of a person, nor here the name of a place, nor now the name of a time. All these words, I, here, now, are precisely the terms that should not be used in physics according to the standard acceptation of what a physical theory is, namely a theory of what is out there independently of me, independently of this place, independently of this time which, which we call now. Okay? So it's usually said that it's characteristic of physics not to use these words. And yet, in quantum physics, there has been a lot of pressure to introduce these words because it's quite difficult to get a, a, a description of the world as it is independently of what we do, independently of where we are, independently of this very moment of, uh, you know, experimental work. Because a single event, a single event, a single click in a Geiger counter is cannot be detached from this particular occurrence here and now of the Geiger apparatus. So, according to Chris Hooks, Cubism, this interpretation of quantum physics, is concerned not with epistemic probabilities, namely the idea that we ignore certain things that occur spontaneously in the world, but with probabilities are, as guides of action for agents that have to orient themselves in a world that is not already present, that will tr be triggered somehow by, by our actions. So there is, a uh, you know, this interpretation, cubism, comes with a new or not really new, but at least uh, decidedly different interpretation of probabilities. According to the understanding of probabilities by Fuchs, probabilities is the willingness of an agent to place bets. So probabilities is clearly related to an agent. It's not something, here again, that is completely independent of us. The Bayesian conception, according to the Bayesian conception, probabilities are logical constructs, not physical realities. And, in particular, the Psi function, or the state vector, that enable one to calculate probabilities out of the uh, Born's rules, are not description of any physical realities, but it's a logical construct uh, meant to help us to, to place bets. So, a probability is not a statement about what is the case, but about what one can reasonably expect to be the case. And here again, it's the same for the psi function. Deciding in the face of uncertainty, calculating the, bet, the best bet, is probability. Remove gambling and what remains is not, is not probability but abstract measure of theory. So, in order to understand properly probability in this scheme, you don't have just to have the formalism 
the formalism of measure theory, you have to understand that it's a concrete tool for a concrete agent to place bets. What is, okay, the, the first thing, this interpretation of quantum physics is purely instrumentalistic. It's just a system of probabilistic valuations that are useful for each agent individually to place bets uh, on a phenomena that can occur out of an experiment. Okay, and this, you know, this has been the accusation that has been made uh, against uh, Fuchs Cubis. True, true, when, uh, when Fuchs says that quantum mechanics is just a user's manual for each of us, it looks like, indeed, quantum mechanics is an instrument to place bets in a coherent way. And this looks like very much like uh, you know the famous sentence by Niels Bohr: "Quantum mechanics, according to Bohr, was a purely symbolic scheme permitting only predictions. Okay, nothing more." But <laughs> Chris Fuchs said, "Okay, the fact that we are almost compelled to adopt such kind of interpretation might be an indirect, indirect." sign that we have understood something about the world. Well, according to Fuchs, say, according to Fuchs, the world is such that we can't identify a reality independent of our experimental activity. So in order to prohibit our attempt to represent it, the world must be something very special. And therefore, we have an indirect indi in indication about the, what the world is from the fact that it doesn't enable us to represent it as if it were completely independent of us. According to Fuchs, once again, the world is so wired that our actions are not eliminable epiphenomena. We are completely entangled in the world. We are waved, woven of and one of the signs of this is that when, when two pieces of the world come together, they give birth to facts. But they give birth to facts in the most concrete sense of the world to be born. Namely, you know, when two parents come together, they give rise to something or someone who is completely unpredictable, a child. A child is unpredictable from, or not unpredictable from the parents, with this complete combination of the two. The same for, you know, the micro-entity and the apparatus. Okay, we, the, the, the nice thing with this kind, it immediately dissolves all the so-called paradoxes of quantum physics. So, this is a nice feature. You don't even have to think again about the paradoxes because they don't arise. Ab absolutely don't arise. For instance, Wigner's friend paradox, which is an extreme uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, parox paroxysmal uh, version of the cat's paradox. Uh, usually, it's considered uh, completely absurd because you know when you try to you try to think about what Wigner's friend ascribed to a certain microsystem, you think that uh, he has just as much reasons to ascribe a uh, superposed state as the friend who is outside the laboratory. And yet it's not the case, because the, the friend, Wigner's friend, uh, must ascribe um, a sharp state to the micro system he has observed, whereas, uh, whereas Wigner himself does it. So there is a problem here. There is a problem, apparently, because the two people don't describe the same state. And some, you know, Wigner said, oh, okay, um, you know, my, my friend has a consciousness, and therefore this consciousness has been enough to reduce the state. Okay. But this is completely, um, you know, this 
is just imagination. The, the interpretation of uh, Chris Cooks is much more economical in terms of metaphysics. This interpretation says that the state vector is not something that belongs to uh, you know, the entity, but something that belongs to the agent. So it's, not, it's, it's no wonder that the, the agent, each agent, ascribes a certain state vector as a function of his situation and his knowledge, the information that he has. Okay. So, the fact that the state vector of are not the same is not to be, uh, it's, not, it's not surprising. It's not surprising because the two agents have a completely different situation and a completely different information. And since Psi is nothing about the microsystem, but about the information that the agent has, this is no mystery. Okay, so uh, the problem is that uh, time is running and I want to leave some discussion. And so I will skip the interpretation of Richard Hille, that is a moderate version of cubism, uh, that he has called the, prag the pragmatist interpretation of quantum physics, which is quite interesting. I advise you to read this beautiful book, The Quantum Revolution of, uh, in Philosophy, that was written by Richard Hill. So, and I come to the final slide, the conclusion. Uh, so what is, I, I told you, I asked the question at the beginning, why quantum physics? What is the meaning of the applicability of quantum physics to quantum situations dealing with the human sciences. According to Dietrich Hayez, and I really uh, agree with him, the explanation is very simple. In all these approaches, the presence of quantum structures in cognition is determined by the fact that the cognitive systems under investigation share a common feature with the microphysical systems, namely contextuality. What is the common a feature of a quark and a human being. I think that it's very simple. Both the quark and the human being have not intrinsic determinations. They are devoid of intrinsic determinations. The quark doesn't have a position intrinsically, but relative to an apparatus that enables you to reveal so, uh, this position. Uh, and the human being has no different opinion about anything, but his or her opinions depend on the context in which you, you ask the question. Or it can depend on the order of the questions. So in both cases, in the case of the quark and in the case of the human beings, you don't have an intrinsic determination. So the, the relation between quantum, quantum theory and contextuality, in fact, is very deep then you can obtain many features of quantum theory by positing as a postulate the contextuality of phenomena. And I alluded to many derivations of the standard uh, structure of quantum theory out of this postulate of contextuality. In many forms, actually, according to the derivation, this postulate has taken many forms, but it's always there. Contextuality and mutual incompatibility are the two basic features out of which you can derive some of the structure of quantum theory. But conversely, the structure of quantum theory implies and takes contextuality. And this has been shown by uh, the so-called uh, Boole's inequality. Bull's inequalities are generalized varieties of Bell's inequalities and the validation of these Bull's inequalities imply that the features on which these inequalities bear cannot be decontextualized. But it's the case in quantum theory. In quantum theory, Bull's inequalities and in particular Bell's inequalities are by 
thing. Therefore, contextuality is entailed by the formalism of quantum theory. So there is a, a relation of uh, mutual, you know, of equivalence, in fact, of equivalence between contextuality and quantum theory. And this is what accounts for the remarkable applicability of quantum theory in many situations of uh, the human sciences. Thank you very much for your attention.